So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear guests, my pleasure uh, to open uh, this afternoon meeting with uh, Professor uh, uh, Zimbardo, and we are very glad to have him here uh, in Prague. And uh, I must say that I never saw this room full as today. Uh, and I think that uh, as a dean of this faculty, I, uh, I would wish uh, to have lectures like this. Uh, 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 every every day during our semester, uh, but of course, uh, uh, is to have uh, such professors uh, every day uh, here at the faculty. Uh, we can work to solve this uh, for the future. Uh, I think that uh, uh, for the law faculty, I would uh, like to say really only a few words. Uh, I think that when we were approached by uh, Michal Žantovský from Václav Havel Residential Library, uh, we were honored uh, uh, and we can offer this uh, lecture hall. Uh, and I must say that I personally was uh, convinced from the very beginning that it is a really good idea because when I saw uh, five years ago, 1992 documentary on Stanford prison experiment, I can uh, then dream to be in this faculty and to have Professor Ricardo uh, here. And uh, uh, today it come through. So uh, let me say that uh, very pleased to uh, host this lecture, and the uh, floor is uh, yours. Thank you. In concrete, Professor Zimbardo, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure uh, for me to be here today with uh, uh, Professor Zimbardo and our thanks go to the and uh, Faculty of Law of the Charles University in Prague for uh, enabling us to this, uh, talk here. Uh, I don't think I will have to spend much time introducing Professor Zimbardo. He is a uh, professor of psychology, <laughs> emeritus at the Stanford University in California. He became known, as you will all remember, for, in 1971 for the Stanford prison experiment. Which, uh, later, he is an author of a number of uh, uh, textbooks and uh, programs on psychology, also of books like if the effect, the time paradox, and found the heroic imagination project about which. So, uh, without you, Professor, the floor is yours, and then we will have some talk, and then we will have some questions and answers. So.
Okay. Uh, with that introduction, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I first came to Prague in 1969, in the summer before most of you were born. Uh, there was internet service, and I came to Prague full of excitement, uh, not expecting to see what I saw, Russian tanks on almost every corner, uh, not enough food, uh, people feeling very depressed and very paranoid, uh, but pretty soon that uh, iron curtain lifted uh, and you had the wonderful uh, Velvet Spring. And then I was fortunate to come back again in 2005 to receive the Vaclav Havel Humanitarian Award and actually spend much time with him and got to know him as a person as well as a revolutionary and one of my favorite heroes. Uh, last year, I received again the um, uh, Medal of Science from the Czech Academy of Science. And just last week, I received honorary, honorary doctorate from Charles University. So I am now embedded in Prague. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why uh, the future holds a, 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 an exciting relationship between me, my heroic project, and the people in Prague. Um, so as you know, Sadly, I'm most famous for creating evil. <clears throat> uh, in fact, because I look like this, Dr. Evil. Um, um, but the reason I did that study, two, two reasons I did that study, uh, as you know, earlier in the 1960s, Stanley Milgram did the famous study of blind obedience to authority. And in his study, ordinary men and one group of women, not students, ages 20 to 50, two of every three delivered painful, even lethal shock to somebody they thought was their student. Um, and that was the first study demonstrating the power of social situations to undercut our sense of morality. So someone in authority is telling you to do something that goes against your moral conscience. And when you're not in the situation, everybody says, no, I would not do it. And now you're sitting there, he's in the lab coat, he says, you must go on, you must do it. Gives you a role, you are the teacher, the person you're, the person you're hurting is supposed to be helping is your student. And people got into the role and 65% of all people in his study went to the full extent 450 volts. Now, one of the interesting sidelights of that study is little Stanley Milgram was a little Jewish boy. He was my classmate in 1949-1950 in the Bronx, New York City. We were in the same class. So later, in thinking about his study, I said, it's very rare somebody tells you to harm someone else. You're playing a role. Uh, you're a prison guard. And in that role, nobody says you have to harm prisoners, but you know that role is one of power. You have to exercise power over other people. And if you're a prisoner, you know your role is to rebel, but you have limited power, and ultimately the guards can overwhelm you. And so that's what I wanted to do, to see, to add uh, to the idea of the power of social situations. So Milgram's study and, and the Stanford Prison study are really bookends illustrating the power of social situations over individual um, personality. Now, the reason I was interested in creating evil, because most people who study evil are media people, are journalists, are historians, criminologists. They interview people from the Holocaust. Uh, they go to prisons, they interview mass murders. I wanted, to st I wanted to see the transformation. I want to start on day one, we know every single person in this room is a good person, has never done anything wrong. And the question is, could, could we flip a switch? Not a switch, could we flip a switch and those people will begin to do the reason I asked that question is when I was a, a little child, this very sensitive microphone, when I was a little child, uh, growing up in New York City in the South, I was surrounded by evil, evil men 
who would give children money to do illegal things, to give, uh, take, uh, run drugs, steal from stores, if it was a woman to sell her body. And when you're poor, you do things for money. When you're rich and you're a child, you get an allowance. You don't have to do anything, maybe do the dishes or something. But when you're poor, you have to do things which are often, you know, are illegal. And the problem was I had friends who were, I knew were good boys who did bad things. But me and some other friends resisted because money is a was a temptation. Uh, and so I asked myself when I was a little kid a basic psychological question. What is the difference between kids who gave into temptation and kids who resisted? Well, it's a psychological question and I couldn't answer until I got to be an old guy ready to do research on the Stanford Prison Experiment and other research I had done uh, earlier. But when I finished that study, for me it was a little demonstration. I never wrote a book about it. I wrote uh, articles and I filed it away. I started doing research on the psychology of shyness Shyness as a self-imposed psychological prison in which when a sh if you're a shy person, nobody says you are shy, you say I am shy. And what? Because I'm shy, I can't ask a question. Because I'm shy, I can't ask a girl for a date. Because I'm shy, I can't ask for a raise when I deserve it. So, so I began to study shyness as, as a self-imposed silent prison of, sh of, of silent prison. And then I was the first person in 1972 to ever study shyness in adults. Psychologists only studied shyness in little children. So I started a shyness um, uh, research center at Stanford, and then we started a shyness clinic to help students who were shy to overcome it. And we were very successful. The shyness clinic I started in 1972 is still operating in California. And it's the only one of its kind in the world. And we are 100% successful. Because we know what shyness is and we know how to turn the switch to turn it off. So, so for me, um, the reason to do research of any kind in psychology is to try to understand something fundamental about human nature. And if you think you do understand it, then you ought to be able when you're looking at negatives, you ought to be able to design procedures to prevent it, to make it better, or to overcome it. So the Shyness Clinic is one example of that. Also, the other thing I do is, um, as my host said, I also write popular books that, that millions of people read. Like I wrote a book, Shyness, What It Is, What To Do About It. And the same way recently, I wrote a book on the prison study. I didn't write that till 2008. 1971, 2008, um, in, order to, in order to share my views of why do good people turn evil. Um, but then I realized I'm spending my life still understanding my, the problem I had as a little kid. The really interesting question is not why do good people turn evil, but the other side. Is it possible for ordinary people, any of us, to become heroes? Nobody asked that question. Because before I started asking that question, in chapter 16 of The Looser Effect, if you have the book, start chapter 16 and go backwards. Um, uh, because um, until I asked that question, most people who were interested in heroes uh, put heroes on a pedestal. Heroes are Agamemnon, heroes are Achilles, heroes are Mahatma Gandhi, heroes are Vaclav Havel, uh, heroes are Martin Luther King, so people, Mother Teresa, people who are on a pedestal. And I said, that's really nice, but I'm interested in can we teach anyone the skill and strategy and knowledge to become an ordinary, we call it ordinary hero. So that's been my mission in the last 10 years, creating a hero factory, producing, uh, teaching young people how to be social change agents. So what you saw in that little video, which a student made in Poland, um, 
is something we are about to bring to Prague. So what I have done is I have created a number of lessons in social psychology, all of them organized around basic themes like why don't people help in an emergency? How can we transform people who are passive bystanders looking at someone suffering into people who are active heroes? Heroes act. Heroes, we teach you the skills and strategy to be a wise and effective action hero. Not a superhero, an ordinary hero, everyday hero. And our program then is, uh, we developed each, each of our lessons in great depth and we give these to teachers, now to businesses, mostly for high school and college. Our program is in the west coast of America. I, I live in San Francisco near Stanford University. Um, and, but now, since I travel so much, every place I go, I do a training. I teach people how to use our lessons. So our program is all over Hungary. If you have not been to Budapest, it's my third favorite city after San Francisco and Prague. It's wonderful for students. Uh, we are now in 1,300 high schools throughout Hungary, our program. Uh, we're all over Poland. Uh, my family is Sicilian. We have programs in the ghetto in Palermo. Our program is in uh, Bali, Indonesia, where I'm going to go next week. Our program is in Geelong, Australia. Uh, it's about to be in Germany, about to be in Norway. But I talked about this last week when I was here, and there are a number of people in Prague who said, we want your program. Uh, we want it in the Jewish Memorial at Bubni. Uh, I gave a talk in the medical school. People there said we, we'd like it. Uh, and so we're, I'm working with a number of people here to say, uh, let's arrange for different groups to license our program, and then the training will be the best trainers are people I work with in, in uh, Budapest because they, they do training literally almost every day. That is, they teach teachers, they teach business people how to use our material. And they said they're willing to do training in Budapest. People go there or they're willing to come here. So I'm really excited because uh, this may be the first place where, in every place it's like a single foundation. But here in, in Prague, it looks like four or five very different groups say, we each want to do it independently. And so, so that's, that's what I'm really excited about, uh, that I think it's hap it will happen. So I think with that, I'm going to have a dialogue with my old friend, and then afterwards, questions from you. And then if you want, at the end, selfies. think that you have five or six groups around this country wanting to do the heroic imagination project I think you have seven the library wants to do one too all right so, all right let's uh, do it all right uh, now what I found you, you you didn't talk about one uh, you didn't speak about uh, one part of your work that uh, uh, deals with time with no, time perspectives yeah. no. and and so on. And I particularly liked when you said, I was here in 1969, and short time later you had the Velvet Revolution and you had freedom. Well, yeah. short time later was 20 years. Yeah. Well, that's that's, that's time, time perspective too. Right. right? <laughs> but let me start with a general question. Uh, back to evil. Where, where does evil come from? Is it, a, or a propensity for doing evil, is it an integral part of what we are? Is it the legacy of the original sin, as some people would believe? Is it a part of our evolutionary equipment, as Conrad Lawrence claimed in the book on aggression? Uh, or is evil, as you, some of your studies seem to suggest, contextual, situational, a product of certain set of conditions? So, which of the... All of the above. All of the above, right. Uh, no, I mean, um, now that I'm working on, on the good side, 
So th when I was a child, my parents, my Sunday school teacher said, there's a line between good people like us and bad people like them. And the line was like a safety line. The idea was you couldn't be dragged across, and, and if you were bad, you were doomed to be there. Um, and, and every once in a while, I would see it didn't work that way. People I knew who were good ended up doing bad things. People who were identified as bad asked for forgiveness, did penance, and, and was saved. Um, and, uh, and so the idea is the line between good and evil is flexible. I mean, any of us can be uh, drawn across that line. So, so the, the, the prison study and the Milgram study just is, sounds an alarm to say it's easy, relatively easy, to be seduced to do bad things. And, and it's usually a gradual process. It's like telling a little lie, a bigger lie, uh, uh, um, uh, hitting somebody gently, then hitting them harder, and then killing. So it's, it's a process. Now, for most of us, we never do evil. But there is, in all of us as children, the idea is suppose I gave you total power, that you could do anything you want with this power. You could control the universe. So all, in, in the olden days, all stories like Frankenstein, like the mad scientist, suddenly somebody had this power and, and they almost always used it to dominate people, to, to dominate, to control. Um, and, um, and it's only recently that people say, no, you should use power for good. So superheroes come along and superheroes suddenly are the creator of cartoonists each of whom has a special ability, a special talent, and their enemy is always evil of different kind. When I talk to high school students, and sometimes college students like you, they say, you know what? Every superhero envies you, because you have something that no superhero has. Spider-Man, no. Wonder Woman, no. Uh, Batman, no. Superman, no. You have a brain. <laughs> Superheroes do not have a brain. They can fly, they can swim, they can run up building. They don't have a brain. Their brain is the brain of the cartoonist who made them. So now they envy you. And therefore what? What are you going to do with your brain to make the world better? That, that's that's the, the pressure that I now put on you. So that you now have to use that brain to become not a superhero, but what I'm calling an everyday hero, who every day does an e extraordinary deed of kindness and compassion and sharing. So essentially our, our hero project teaches young people of all ages, but mostly as I said middle school, high school, college, how to be a social change agent. So the knowledge in psychology, which is special different from any other field, is we, we have studied, not just me, many of us psychologists have studied by understanding human nature, we can do things that makes human nature shine, makes it better. We can do things that prevent people from drifting to the negative side of that line between good and evil. And so that's, that's what I have devoted, have devoted, will devote my, my whole life to. All right, uh, let's take this one step further. Uh, you seem to be implying that people are made to do evil and they can be made to be heroes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you've been quoted on the Czech radio today as saying nobody... Yeah. Yes, today. As saying nobody thinks they're committing evil. Right, that's true. And, and I wonder, I mean, the Stanford prison experiment was, and I like that expression, was done with clinically sane students. In my field in psychology, I worked with clinically insane right. people. And uh, there is a difference, and some people seem to be enjoying doing evil. I mean, they seem to enjoy hurting other people in the full knowledge that it is evil. So are there, are there two kinds of evils, the situational and, and what I would say call the pure evil? Or is there such a thing as a pure evil? I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, these are profound questions. I mean, the na Understanding evil has been part of every religion forever. In fact, on the other side is there's more evil done in the name of God than in the name of the devil. 
there's the Crusades, where people say, my religion is the only one, your religion is wrong, and I have to prove that by going, literally going to war. Um, let me see, how should I put this? Um, in the Stanford Prison Experiment, as you know, we, I went to great lengths to pick 24 young college students who were smart, well-educated, from all over America to play the role of prisoner and guard. We gave them a battery of personality tests, seven different personality tests, and we only picked, of all the people who applied, we only picked those who were absolutely normal on every personality dimension. And then we randomly assigned one to be guard, one to be prisoner, one to be guard, one prison. So it means at the beginning there was no difference in the 12 boys who are guards and the 12 boys who are prisoners. Within two days there was no similarity. Every boy who became a guard became totally different than every boy who was a prisoner. They were, their whole mentality was organized around power, around dominance, about control, about making the life of prisoners, making prisoners feel powerless and helpless. The prisoner's role was to rebel. And when you did, you got punished, okay? Um, and so, but what happened is, it's 1971. That was the time of the Vietnam War. Students, not only in America, but around the world, were protesting the war, which is immoral and illegal, and in many cases, protesting actively. Uh, in, in college campuses, uh, the university administration often called the police onto the campus to, to uh, stop student riots. And so students, in, in one case, in a, a university called Kent State, the police actually killed students, shot them dead, okay? So now nobody, like, no students like policemen, no students like prison guards. So in our study, no one wanted to be a guard. So that's, that's really important. So it's not like some some people had sadistic impulses. We said, oh, you're going to be a guard. Said, oh, good, good, I can, I can dominate. Nobody wanted to be a guard. They said, guards are pigs. We don't want to do that. But they had to do it. Within two days, boys who were guards were loving it, enjoying it, having that power. So for me, evil is really about power, that suddenly you have almost absolute power over somebody else. And if you're a student, you have intellectual power really smart, you have more power than somebody else, your power is at a good grade. But now you have power over the life of other people. And, and then what happened was for many of the guards, they became creatively sadistic. Now the problem of evil, to simplify it is, when you are bored, it motivates you to do things you ordinarily would not for your enjoyment. So the guards had to work eight hours, a long time. We didn't tell them to do anything. We said, you know, be sure the prisoners are, are orderly, give them some tasks to do, see they don't escape. They could, they could have played cards, but instead now they had prisoners as their playthings, okay? And one of the guards said later, the prisoners were like our puppets. We were the puppeteers. We could manipulate them, get them to do whatever we wanted. So that's the ultimate dehumanization. You're a college student, and you know by a flip of the coin, you could have been in the, in the prisoner uniform instead of the guard's uniform. And now you're saying, these other people, they said people, are our puppets. And we are manipulating them like puppeteers. And so in many cases, in a very short time, people began to play the role of guard and they became the role. They became the worst, what it means to be a guard, is to dominate, to um, uh, dehumanize uh, the people playing the role of prisoner. And we saw this around the world. In 2004, American prison guards in a prison in Iraq called Abu Ghraib did the same thing as our guards did. Put bags over prisoners head, stripped them naked, started simulating um, sexual degrading acts. Our guards did that in three or four days. In Abu Ghraib, it took uh, two or three months. So, so there's, there's a, it's hard to know where that impulse comes. I think in this case, you're put in a situation which you've never been in before. I, I, I do have to add one thing is, see, 
when you have freedom of choice, you choose your life so that every situation you're in is safe, secure. If I want to know what you're going to do tomorrow, I say, what did you do yesterday? Tomorrow's going to be yesterday, played over. Slightly, slight differences. But now, suddenly, you're a prison guard or you're a prisoner in a situation totally unfamiliar. There's also other research done uh, by my colleague David Rosen, and was suddenly, we're going to make you into a mental patient. You're going to pretend to be a mental patient. Well, you don't know what that means. So, so now when we put you in a totally new situation, the situation influences how you behave rather than your, your pre-planned um, um, vision. Well, no, no, there's no question that uh, uh, what you described and analyzed in your experiments uh, uh, happens in real life. In, in some situation, it is apparently true that there are physiological and mental limits beyond which the moral integrity of most people breaks down, as stories of the Nazi extermination camps and Stalinist torture chambers and the POW camps and other such situations seem to suggest. And actually, I have a personal, you know, quite strong and shameful such memory. I was uh, in the 70s during the communist days. I was in military service and I was drafted into a massive exercise of the Warsaw Pact forces in January it was minus 20 degrees centigrade, and we didn't get anything to eat for four days. And after four days of this, you know, I suddenly realized that if I was ordered to burn a village and, and you know, shoot the people just to get a piece of bread or a warm bed, yeah, I would probably do it. And, uh, and it stayed with me ever since. And it's, it's a very humbling thought because in our comfortable world, we often live with the false certainty that our moral values will protect us from, right. from, from doing evil in any conceivable situation. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, um, like children depend on your, our parents to create a safe environment for us. And then as we get older, we really depend on our government, on our politicians, on our president, on our legislature. Uh, and, you know, again, in Eastern Europe, you suffered 10 years of Nazis and 30 or 40 years of communists, and then there was suddenly freedom. But my big concern now is around the world, right-wing totalitarianism slash fascism is coming back. Uh, we have it in America in the f form of a man named Donald Trump, who, uh, is a, uh, who will lose the election but millions of Americans will vote for him, even though he's a sexist, he's a racist, he's stupid, uh, but, <laughs> but he has power. So people are turning to leaders who have power. And power say, I do whatever I want, okay? And people, many people throughout the world now feel, um, I don't have enough money. In the communist days, things were bad, but it was equal. Some of your parents might say, now, my life is better, but I'm envious of all the people around me who have a better car, a better house, a better job, more food, uh, they dress better. So now there is this inequality. So now around the world, rich people are richer than ever, and poor people are poorer than ever. So the inequality gap in almost every nation around the world is growing year by year. And that's creating resentment of the people at the bottom. So this is what Donald Trump in America is, is fueling, even though he's a multi-billionaire, that he's getting people to say, elect me, give me your power, and then I will get you jobs, and we're going to keep out the migrants, we're going to keep out the Mexicans, we're going to, whatever. Uh, here's a man who wants to be a politician. I don't know if he's ever visited Europe. I don't know if he's ever visited Asia. I don't know if he's ever visited South America. He knows nothing about world, world politics. Um, but he's not alone. I just came, I said, I just came from Budapest. In Budapest, there's a party called Jobbik. Two of every, two of every um, 10 Hungarians vote that party in. It's a fascist party. 
They are anti-Semitic now, publicly. They are anti-gay. They're anti-everything. 20% of the Hungarian people vote for that party. And so now, Viktor Orban's party says, we're not as bad as them. You know, we are only extremely totalitarian. We control the media. We control everything. Uh, and so the Orban party, again, is anti-migrant, uh, anti-Roma people, also anti-gay. Last year, when I, when I came to Budapest, I usually go twice a year for our hero. We have, as I said, we have our best hero program there called Hero Square. From the airport in Budapest, there were hundreds of huge billboards saying, the migrants are coming to take your job. There are no jobs for Hungarians. The migrants don't want to be in Hungary. The migrants want to pass through Hungary. But before there was a single migrant on the soil of Hungary, people were afraid. So this is another psychological thing that all tyrants do. They create fear of the other. Fear they're going to take your job. Uh, they're going to... They're going to uh, uh, take your land, and, and so it creates this enormous, enormous fear. Mm. And now in Poland, I do a lot of work in Poland, um, there it's different. In Poland, it's really old rural Catholics. So the, the party is called Law and Justice. It's illegal and unjust. As soon as they got in, elected officials were replaced by politicians. They are now trying to vote against, they want people to vote to limit abortion of all kinds. It doesn't matter if the woman is raped, it doesn't matter if the child is deformed. So this is the old-fashioned Catholics. And, uh, uh, and, and if a woman has an abortion, she could go to jail and the, the doctor could go to jail. Now, it lost narrowly in the election, but everybody I know in Poland says they will think of a way to get around that. Um, and, and so here we have the example in Poland and Italy, this right-wing government. Uh, in, in Slovakia, it's moving in that direction. Uh, there's some hint that in Czech Republic, there's some, some, uh, some problem of, of the government uh, wanting to... <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Uh, but anyway, so, so, but I, I, I'm concerned that democracy is on the, the decline and right-wing totalitarianism, so I won't say fascism, is on the rise. Yes, indeed. I mean, we don't have to be shy about it. In, in this country, we also have politicians who say that the migrants, of which there are none in this country, are you know, coming here to steal our jobs, rape our women, and, and murder us all. So you know, we, we, we are out there with the worst of them. Uh, but uh, let me play the devil's advocate for, okay. for, a, for, for a little while. You said, and that's true, I mean, all the statistics show that inequality is uh, on the rise around the world in, in developed countries in particular. And the many popular books have been lately written about it. At the same time, I'm not entirely certain that it is true that while the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. I think most data would show that the poor get richer except the richer get richer faster than, than the poorer. But in, in areas like uh, hunger, uh, controlling disease, okay. you know, a vast progress has been made over the last 50 years. So uh, what does it say about the psychology of yeah. how well off am I and, no. and as compared to you? No, that's really good. So it really is, it's all in your, in your mind. So, um, yeah, I mean, objectively, the rich get richer, meaning they have more money in the bank, uh, they have uh, more stocks, more bonds, more, they own more land, richer houses. And, uh, and as you said, uh, poor people are not getting poorer. Uh, they, they are better off uh, now than they were 10 years ago. But, but the, it's, it's a psychological perception. That is, uh, I, my life is not as good as it could be. Because I'm looking at Donald Trump, I'm looking at millionaires, I'm looking at people driving, you know, big fancy cars. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the, the media, people going to uh, opening of a film festival. Uh, I'm looking at people, young people going to rock concerts. I can't afford that. Um, so, um, so it is that perception that my life is not, the quality of my life is not as good as it should be. And I want somebody to make it better. 
Now, I, usually, when you're young, you turn to your parents. Well, they say, no, we can't, we can't make it better. We, we're limited to the job. And that, that's then where politicians come in. The, the politicians say, we will make your life better. We, we will make America great. We will make Czech Republic great. We, whatever it is. And the question is, how? How would you? So in America, nobody asked Donald Trump, how will you do it? He has never said once how he will do all these wonderful things. Well, I mean, he's been, he's been lecturing, he's been debating, and people say, you got to tell me how. What is your plan? Give me, give me five ways you're going to make America better for me, N not in the world. How is my life, so the question every citizen says, how will my life be better if we elect you as president? You have to tell me. Give me five ways. Give me three ways. Give me two at least. And nobody does that. They, everybody is going for slogans. Now, you said at the beginning, I have to go back. Uh, nobody ever does evil. The interesting thing is in the, in the preface of Mein Kampf, which is Hitler's um, bio, autobiography, my, my world, he says, in dealing with the Jewish question, I am doing the Lord's work. So in your mind, you, you come up with a justification. So human beings, so all the research, the other research I did earlier is on the psychology of cognitive dissonance. And it says, human beings are not rational. We are rational, rationalizing. We can justify anything. We can come up with a reason why we are doing a bad thing. We can come up with a reason why people like us are doing bad things and make it seem as if it's good. Uh, so, so this is something you have to realize that this incredible human mind can distort reality, can make something that's clearly evil, can justify it in a way. So Hitler's saying, by ridding the world of Jews, the vermin, uh, I'm doing God's work because God wants Nazis to be the superior Aryan race. And so he convinced himself. So nobody ever says, hey, I, I really did a bad... I really did a bad thing. You always can come up with a reason, a justification for why you did something which other people say is, is no good. All right. Uh, let me ask you a question. In, in The Lucifer Effect, the book that is, I believe, partly derived from, from the Stanford Prison Experiment. You know, ten chapters. Yeah, yes. A chapter on each day. Yeah, for sure. You, you describe seven steps on the slippery slope to evil, mindlessly taking the first small step, the humanization of others, the individuation of self in anonymity, diffusion of personal responsibility, blind obedience to authority, and critical conformity to group norms and passive tolerance of evil through inaction or indifference. Good. So those are the... Okay, I, I studied a little, you know. Okay, I, yeah. I, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but those are the internal factors that conceivably you can, you can do something about. But then there are also steps that more or less uh, uh, depend on the external factors, the external techniques that have been used to break down the person resistance to doing evil, such as brainwashing, ideological indoctrination, sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation, collective psychosis, uh, disinformation, torture, etc., etc. Uh, is there any way to defend oneself against those? That's a lot of bad shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that answer. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, um, no, for some, I mean, many of the things you just said are the worst of good people doing bad things. So there are people whose job it is to be a torturer. So um, in America, we went through this terrible thing. Um, again, uh, after, after the uh, terrorist bombing on September 11, 2001, uh, Everyone in America was afraid it's going to happen again. So we have to find out who, who are the, um, um, you know, the suicide bombers, uh, who are the um, jihadists. Uh, who, this is even before ISIS, but, but we want to know who they are. And in, by all means necessary, that's a critical phrase. That means I will do anything I have to to get information that I think you have that will save my life and the life of my family. By all means necessary includes torture. 
and in the end includes killing you if you don't if you don't if you don't give in. And so, America, Americans began to torture prisoners that they had captured, uh, uh, prisoners with Arab backgrounds, uh, from Pakistan, from Iraq, from from Afghanistan, and psychologists were helping to train the torturers in how to do torture most effectively. It was a big, big debate, still is a big debate in, in American psychology about... Um, enhanced. And what, and, yeah, enhanced. They call, see, again, it's... it's a, okay. He just helped. We have to understand the semantics of evil. So, I'm going to torture you, and I'm going to call it enhanced interrogation. Sounds nice. Interrogation, I'm talking. Enhance is pretty. Uh, so we have to always listen to what is the language. So in the Milgram study, he's telling you, we want you to help your student learn better. We want you to help your student improve his or her memory. How are you going to help? By hurting. So the reality is you're hurting, you're delivering electric shock. Your person's screaming. Saying, no, 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 you're helping. Keep helping. So again, you have to, have to go beyond the words, the semantics. Say, what is the reality? If, how could I be helping if the person I'm helping is screaming, not paying attention, uh, uh, is losing, losing consciousness? How could they be learning <laughs> their the, the lesson and they can't? So again, it's, it's really critical to understand um, that people are using language to control. This is George Orwell said this in 1984. People, the ultimate power is the power to control your reality by the language we use. And again, we are in a place here where it's all language. Teachers are coming telling you what they think you should know. Okay? And you assume that what they're giving you is the best available information, but, you know, uh, a thousand years ago, they were telling you about devils and demons, uh, uh, about infidels, if you were in Salamanca, uh, um, uh, where the Inquisition started, uh, in the university, University of Salamanca. Uh, during the Nazi era, there were people coming, telling their students, in the communist era, telling the students what they thought you should know. Uh, and you listened, and you said, Heil Hitler, here's to the Fuhrer. So again, it's always what we're trying to say is, in every situation, you have to do a critical, uh, critical thinking analysis. What, it, what are they saying? What are the alternatives? What happens if I don't do it? Do I really have freedom of thought? Or am I obliged to believe th the way the world is because people in authority, people in power are telling me I must? Now, one of my big concerns has been that we are trained as children to be blindly obedient to authority, our parents, our teachers, our religious leaders. But nowhere do we get trained in the difference between authorities that deserve our respect and many authorities who don't. Many authorities deserve defiance. So we just discovered recently that around the world, thousands of Catholic priests have been raping children, Catholic children, girls and boys. And, and this is in almost every country where the Catholic Church has been. And when it was discovered, they simply moved the priest to a different parish. And when it was discovered at, at the top level, uh, they simply retired. The children who were taught to be obedient to authority, to their priests, not one of them, of thousands of children, ever told their parents, ever told anyone in Sunday school about this. So for me, this is, and, and still, Pope Francis, said, when, he, when he got to be Pope, said, you know, we will have a big uh, investigation. A few years ago, nothing. So now the Catholic Church has, even this, he's the most, should be the most powerful man, have suppressed that investigation. Uh, so again, it's, it's, in quote, politics as usual simply means people in power know what to do to keep their power. And sometimes they have to suppress negative information, sometimes they have to uh, uh, excessively promote a little bit of positive. Mm. Wow.
Admittedly, the Catholic Church usually takes a few centuries to, to correct its uh, uh, mistakes. But uh, uh, let's, let's move to a, a more positive note to, to your heroic imagination okay. project. Good. You Good. seem, you, you work with former young delinquents, former gang members, etc., etc., and you teach them to overcome what you were just describing, the, yeah, the bystander bad effect. Shit. Overcome bad shit. Overcome bad shit, the fixed mindset, social yeah. conformity, yeah. Uh, stereotypes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What, what techniques are you using to do that? Oh, um, see, I mean, psychology, and especially social psychology, cognitive psychology, cognitive neuropsychology, is more interesting now than ever. So if you're not taking psychology, you should take it. Uh, because it's, when I, I, I took psychology, you know, again, I, I took introductory psychology in 1950. I was so excited, I'm gonna answer that question. What's the difference between good people and bad people? Um, and it was boring. It was the most boring course in the universe. I couldn't believe. His rats running mazes, his students learning nonsense syllables. Who cares about a nonsense syllable? I want to learn about sensible syllables. Um, and, and then it was color wheels. And, I mean, and, and nothing was connected. Uh, and I was a really good student. I got all A's, except in introductory psychology, I got a C. C, C. <laughs> the only C from kindergarten to graduate school. So I said, forget, forget psychology. I switched. I majored in sociology, I majored in anthropology, and it wasn't until I was graduating that a friend of mine who was a psychology major said, hey, I need a research partner in my course. And I said, no, I hate that stuff. He said, please do me a favor. I said, okay. And then suddenly we started to do research, and oh my God, this is what I love. So I started doing research, and in my senior year, I took all psychology and then graduated, went to Yale graduate school, and then fell in love with it. But now psychology is really more interesting than ever. In part, it's because when I was a student, most of psychologists were men. Actually, old, ugly men. <laughs> now, most of psychology is women. Beautiful, young, talented women, okay? <laughs> and what women have brought in, instead of, instead of trying to understand um, violence, aggression, war, Peace psychology, uh, family psychology, health, psych health psychology is, is a really newest area. Uh, so, so women have brought in really a positive, did I just turn this off? No, no, it's uh, Women have brought in a focus on uh, what is positive in human nature that should be brought out. Because men used to study the negative, me included. Let's study the negative because then maybe we could overcome it. So instead of studying mental illness, Women come into psychology and say, no, we want to study mental health. We want to study meditation. We want to study how to make the human condition better. Uh, start off with, rather than let's study the negative, because maybe we could turn it around. Uh, so for me, so now the study of memory is the most interesting ever. I said, when I started, it was literally rats, learning rats, running Y mazes to get food. Yeah. Or students learning memory, nonsense syllables on a memory drum. And now it's the neurobiology of memory, it's, it's uh, brain mechanisms in memory, it's, it's uh, people who have exceptional memory, people who've lost their memory. So just that one area is exciting. So within psychology, social psychology, again, is, is really, really exciting. With a parenthesis, there can never be, again, a study like Milgram or Zimbardo because of ethical issues, which in that case, it's sad. Maybe we ask questions later about it. Uh, but other than that, psychology is interesting, fascinating, uh, and, and the idea is to use knowledge to make the world better, rather than use knowledge to write, do an experiment, to publish it in a journal, to put it in a library for other academics. Well, uh, it apparently depends on, on the years when you studied and and on, on the country, because when I studied psychology in this country, uh, I was one of the three men in a class of 50 people, which was great. And, uh, <laughs> and I couldn't leave 
well enough alone, so I ended up in politics, which is full of men only. Oh, and, uh, bad no, mistake. Bad mistake, yeah. <laughs> but I, I just, before we finish here and turn it over to, uh, to the people in the room, I, I, I want to ask you a little about the time perspectives, yeah, yeah. because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very intriguing to me. You work with basically six uh, levels or dimensions, two in the past, past positive and past negative, uh, two in the present, present hedonism and present fatalism, <laughs> and uh, two in the future, future live goal-oriented time perspective and future transcendental. Right. Uh, time perspective. Great. Now it, and and you seem to s believe that uh, a lot of past positive, uh, a moderate amount of present hedonism, and uh, and a lot of future life goal oriented time perspective makes for happiness in life, and for for a good life. Now it sounds fairly simple, almost like a hi-fi yeah. audio equalizer, right, right. Yeah. Uh, but how does it square with other concepts of time perspective, like in gestalt therapy when uh, you would attach much more of a premium to the present, the here and now, with psychoanalysis which would attach much more of a premium to the past, or with various versions of transcendentalism which would favor the transcendental right. future. Yeah. So is there any role for the transcendental future in your theory? Oh, okay. So, um, the reason, everything I do is, is autobiographical. So why did I study time perspective? I should say, you know, all my life I'm focusing on the power of situations over personality. In fact, uh, I always talk about all the research in personality predicts almost nothing. The best personality tests uh, correlate with each other only 0.2 or 0.3, meaning they explain very little of the variability in behavior. And so here I developed a scale, the Zimbardo Time Perspective Inventory, ZTPI, which is the most valid, the most reliable scale. People are using it around the world, hundreds and hundreds of researchers, many young people uh, in, in, in 20 or 30 different countries, and everybody who's using our scale is getting significant results. So if you don't have a dissertation, think about it. Now, uh, as, as was mentioned, is that when I thought about time perspective, the big zones are past, present, and future. We live, we live our life in one or the other of those, or we switch from one to the other. Um, and the reason I began to study it was, again, growing up poor in the Bronx, my father was often unemployed, and he didn't care. He enjoyed being unemployed because he didn't like to work. He liked to party. Uh, he never should have gotten married. We have six, six people in our family. He, um, he, was a, he was a musician. He could play all instruments. He could sing. He could dance. So he loved to go partying. Uh, later on, he would have been a rock and roll guy. Um, but we were poor. We didn't have food. And, and, and it was clear to me that the only way out of poverty is to be educated. And to be educated means one thing, to learn about being future-oriented. Learn what I'm going to do today, I'm not going to go play with my friends, I'm going to study, because when I get the exam tomorrow, I'm going to do well and they're not. And if I do well on the exam, I'm going to get promoted. If I get promoted, I go to the next level. And finally, I, I graduate, I get, a, I get a better job. So it was clear, as a little kid, I had to be educated. For my father, I had to go to work. And I had to fight my father against studying, he, he said, don't study, you're going to burn your eyes out. Uh, go play. I said, no, Dad, I have to study, I have to do well. And he never, he never cared about being poor. He, he was, he's what we call present hedonistic. He enjoyed living in the moment. And that's okay if you're single. That's okay, or if you have a lot of money. But it's not okay if you have a family. The most interesting thing is 1947... My father, with no education, my father didn't go to high school. In 1947, my father built a television set. Television was invented in the world in 1946, one year before. 
1947, no one had a television set. My father got a wiring diagram, had somebody teach him how to read it, and made a television set. We showed the World Series of the New York Yankees against the Brooklyn Dodgers. My, my friends paid 25 uh, coins to see it. And everybody was excited. They said, Dad, okay, you know how to do it. Now we can, we can make many. We make a lot of money. We can get out of poverty. No, no, no. The challenge was to do one. I did one. I don't want to do it again. I couldn't believe it. I said, Dad, what's wrong with you? you know, so, so again, it was, so I, I always was interested in the psychology of time perspective. How could he live in this present hedonistic zone? How could I live in the future? And my mother, of course, was always talking about the good old days, how it used to be when she was a child, uh, when she was uh, living in Sicily. Uh, and so, so my interest in time, and then in the Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, there was a time distortion. Each guard shift was eight hours, guards worked eight hours. Each guard shift was like one day. There was no lights, there was no, there was no um, a clock, there's no objective time. So each guard shift was like a day. When that shift came, it was like the end of a day. Next shift came on. Not only for the prisoners, but also for me. So I began to think about, you know, how time is really, psychological time is all here. And so I developed a scale, we started, started doing research. And what we have discovered, not people around the world say, having a balanced time perspective is critical for psychological health, it's critical financially, meaning having a focus on the good things in the past, never the negative. People who live in the negative past are post-traumatic stress disorder focus. You want to be present hedonistic, but only as a reward for achieving something being future-oriented. Transcendental future simply means you live your life to be a good person so when you die, you go to heaven rather than hell. And only some people in some religions believe that. So for example, Jews don't believe in heaven or hell. They don't have that concept. So that's, that's irrelevant. So it's really a balanced time perspective called BTP now is focus positive in the past, never, never in the negative past, present hedonistic, present fatalistic means it doesn't pay to plan, because nothing ever works out. So poor people think that. Uh, Muslim people think that, because Allah uh, determines your fate. Uh, and, but the future, but not extreme, because you don't want to be a workaholic. So, but again, there's a lot of, lots of research that says, when we identify people who have that balance, we see all the, many, many things in their life are, are much better than people who don't have that balance. Um, so I wrote a book called The Time Paradox, and then I wrote another book, The Time Cure, how you use these ideas in therapy. Um, that's it. Uh, all right, this would uh, start another very interesting debate. I mean, uh, it's, it's still a debated question whether there is a Jewish concept of hell or not. In Jerusalem, there is a, a place uh, which is called Hinon, and it is by tradition the entrance to hell. Oh, really? So, yeah, they, they think of something, but they don't have strong ideas about afterlife. You're, no, right. No, you, you're right about no, that. But I should say one thing. You're going to open the question now? Uh, when you finish. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> one thing is um, so um, I call my book The Lucifer Effect. Why? Um, who was Lucifer? Lucifer was God's favorite angel. This is mythical history. Lucifer means luc light, uh, lucidity. So Lucifer is the bearer of light, of wisdom. And so he was the number one angel of all the angels in the universe. And one day, God decided, he, he was bored with the angels, they're all doing good things. He, he said, I'm going to create a mortal person. I'm going to create Adam my perfect mortal creature. So he told the angels, hey, I'm, I'm, I got this thing, I'm, I'm, I got this Adam, I'm, I'm creating him, uh, and I want, you, I want you all to honor, and, uh, honor, and, uh, honor him. Lucifer and some of the other angels are God, it doesn't make sense. We are immortal, we live forever. By definition, if he's mortal, he's gonna die after, you know, whatever, some years. Uh, and if he's mortal, he's vulnerable, to good and evil. We're angels. We're not vulnerable to good and evil. So, Adam should honor us rather than we honor Adam. 
God said, "Uh uh-oh, you made two sins, disobedience to authority, me, moi, ultimate me, by not doing what I asked you to do. And secondly, the sin of pride. And we have, a, we have a statement, pride goeth before the fall. And so he said, and now you're going to be punished. And so God calls Michael the archangel. All the pictures you see in, in Catholicism of a guy with a spear and a big thing. So he's the mafia hitman of God. Okay? So Thank he's you. It's going my to, name. What? Thank you. It's I my know. name. So he comes down. <laughs> and there's apparently a big cosmic battle. His Lucifer, uh, Beelzebub, uh, Mammon, all the, all the, the angels versus uh, Michael and all the angels who were quiet. And of course, Michael wins with the help of God on the side. And so what does God do? He says, because you have sinned, because what you did, I'm going to consider it a sin. Uh, I'm going to cast you out of heaven and I'm going to put you in a place I'm going to call hell. God created hell to put the fallen angels. So initially, it was, you know, a conceptual place, but then over time in, in our mind became a real place that's somewhere down there. And then at first it was just filled with fallen angels, but then also any later mortal, I mean, after Adam uh, disobeyed God, then any fallen. Uh, now, how did Adam, how did Lucifer, be, how, what did Lucifer do to demonstrate to God that Lucifer was right about Adam and God was wrong? He went to the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent. He first got Eve to eat the the apple from the tree of knowledge that was forbidden, if you remember the story. And then the serpent, who was Lucifer in disguise, got Eve to persuade Adam to also take a bite. The moment Adam bit the apple, he proved that Lucifer was right and God was wrong, that Adam was corrupted. Adam was mortal, that Adam was capable of sin against God, because God said you could do anything, but you can't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And at that moment, what should have God done? He should have said, Lucifer, I made a mistake. I'm going to shut down hell. There's no more business. I want you guys to come back. We start all over. <laughs> Think about it. But that was, God didn't, he didn't take a course in con- psychology of conflict resolution. <laughs> <laughs> had, had he done that, he would have, the whole thing, would, there'd be no hell, there'd be no evil, everybody would be happy, uh, they would give Adam a second, a second chance, or say, you know, you know sw- switch from apples to bananas or something like that. And, and we would all live in paradise ever after. Right. Well, all right. Uh, over to you guys. Uh, who wants to go fast? Oh, where's the mic? And I would ask you to introduce yourselves and uh, Hello. say who you are. So I'm here actually, I have the mic. The mic goes up. Okay. The mic okay. in- My name is Maxim uh, and first of all, thank you very much for sharing so many insights with us. I wanted to ask you a question. What's your perspective on aid and help of technology in uh, helping us to become heroes? On what kind of tech? For example, technologies that could uh, help people in emergency situations or help people to become heroes in such situations. I don't know what you... You say a little more. What kind of technology do you mean? I mean, give me an example of what you mean as a kind of technology. So, an example of a system that guides you to the nearest virus Oh, oh. Oh, oh, yeah. So, oh, that's simple. So essentially, it's, um, that's primitive technology. It's like, um, heroes try to do good in emergencies. So if there was a fire uh, now, or smoke, uh, what would we do? We would all go to the exit we came in on. We would all regress like children. And that if that exit was there and there, many people would be killed trampled because you, we can't, can't, can't all get to that exit. So a hero would say, stop, and say a single line. Everybody will make it. Uh, so technology helps us have exit signs, flashing, uh, fire, fire sign. How to, how to, uh, now, there's another kind of technology that I've been 
uh, arguing against, it's video game technology. So the idea is video games are our newest technology, uh, which is young, many young men around the world are becoming obsessed with playing video game. And video games teach you complex cognitive motor skills, shooting down the enemy. I wrote a book called Man Interrupted, uh, some places called Man Disconnected. It says young men around the world are becoming addicted to playing video games and they would rather play video games than anything in the universe. Rather do it with friends, with girlfriends. Uh, uh, many of them play video games six, seven, eight, 10, 15 hours a day, seven days a week. Nothing wrong with video games in moderation except video games you do in social isolation. You're in your room alone. Okay? And so what are all the things you're not doing if you're playing video games, for, let's say only 10 hours every day? You're not exercising, you're not talking to friends, you're not socializing, you're not doing anything creative, you're not reading, you're not writing, you're not doing your homework, um, uh, you're getting obese, you're sitting, eating junk food, uh, and then the newest thing is, in almost every country around the world, except Iran and China, there's freely available pornography. So the break in playing video games, you press the other button, and up comes 10,000 beautiful dancing women, all of whom want to have sex with you. So you watch them a little bit, yet you yet masturbate, you have orgasm, you put it away, you go back to your video game. So many boys now live in a dual world of playing video games, and watching online pornography. And they would rather do that than anything else. They have given up friends, they have given up girlfriends. Kids are starting at age six years old watching pornography. There's a study in England that uh, free porn sites are among the most visited by children six to 14 years old. Uh, and so I'm arguing this is, this is a dangerous trend happening in almost every country, and it's gonna get worse because these are multi-million or billion dollar industries that compete with each other. Right now, the games are made by men for male values. The video games are dominance, uh, control, competition, and the pornography is, again, dominance, control, objectification of women. So, I believe that eventually, games, will, games and pornography will be made for women because it's a market. But the newest thing that's about to happen within a few months is uh, virtual reality goggles. Google had just uh, invented goggles, made goggles, and it only cost $99. And when you put the goggles on, in the video games, the enemy is not, not on your screen, the enemy is here. When you put the goggles on, the beautiful naked women are not there, they're dancing all around you. I think young men will never take the goggles off and they will live in virtual reality until they die. And that's, that's an alarm I'm sounding. Well, think about it, guys. Uh, <laughs> over there. You are. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Matthew Whitney. That's very, like, it's very much pleasure to meet you in person and um, see and be present to what you share. Well, can you, can you try to do something with the mic so that... Not so close, probably, says Professor, and he's probably right. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so, my question goes to the phenomenon of... Um, now it's working. Uh, um, <laughs> of uh, the seduction uh, by, by the power. And I ask, because um, what I see is that, that the basis of this, uh, of this being able to get seducted by the power is um, the lack of feeling that I have the power of, about my life. Like, I have the power to control fully my life and I'm totally responsible for that. And I'm not responsible for anyone else's life, but I'm responsible for mine. And my question is, uh, do you think that working on um, self-worth, self-esteem, um, being responsible, responsible for one's life helps to prevent this seduction by power. That's a great, great, uh, hello, great question. Um, uh, 
Um, we all have to be responsible for our actions, uh, morally responsible, but, and we want to lead a good moral life. <coughs> <coughs> My hero project goes one step further. It says, I am responsible for you. It means in every situation that I feel Zambar to go in, I suppress egocentrism. I never ask, will people think I'm smart? Uh, will people think I'm funny? Will girls think I'm sexy? I don't ask those questions. I go in saying, who can I make feel special? Who can I give a compliment to? Who can I ask some personal question that makes them feel that Phil Zimbardo ID identified me? And so, in my hero program, it's that everybody should be sociocentric, not egocentric. Egocentrism is the enemy of heroism. If I'm focused on me, I'm not noticing somebody is lying, bleeding. I'm not noticing somebody is sitting, crying. I'm not noticing somebody is in the corner, nobody's talking to, me, shy. So again, we promote the whole idea of we want to go away from me and I to we and us. So the language. So again, it's the moment I say I want to, we, I, I want to, we, that's, that's egocentrism. It's always what can we do? What could we do? So again, I promote the notion of a hero squad. That if something's not working in your family, in your school, uh, when, you, when you challenge as an individual, you, the powers could dismiss you. You know, you're a fanatic. Once you say, once you have three people and say, Sir, we believe that. Now it's a point of view. It has to be recognized as a point of view, as a, in a democracy at least. Uh, so so our, our t what we teach is not only you know, um, how to be an effective bystander, how to change a fixed mindset into growth mindset. We teach these kinds of things, how to change your basic perception away from egocentrism to sociocentrism who day, every day practice the social habits of heroism, being kind, being caring, um, uh, doing good deeds, being social change agents. And that's, that's our orientation. Um, Great, thank you. Really good question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, lady? The lady just, on the... Here, the upstairs? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You are? Um, okay, hello. Uh, I'm Regina. And thank you for a lovely presentation. I really enjoyed it. And um, I have actually two questions, if it's okay. Um, first, you. Me, <laughs> um, first, you said that um, you think that uh, the uh, the situation uh, somehow influences the behavior, and. Don't you think that it might mean that even, for example, mental asylums may um, empower the mental health problems in those people who are in those asylums? And uh, my second question is if you think that uh, coming to power always means that you become somehow evil, and do you think that you are immune to evil? So that's it. No, no, okay. You should answer the mental health. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's uh, there's been a, a lot of criticism uh, starting in the late 60s of the last century of mental health institutions and of some of the effects on uh, behavior of the patients being found out not to be the results of the disease itself, but the uh, results of hospitalization and that led to a, a great liberalization of the of the mental health uh, system to the introduction of various halfway houses and uh, after uh, hospitalization institutions etc etc there is a great movie having something to do with this country uh, it's called one flew over cuckoo's nest uh, it's i think a six oscar movie yeah. made by uh, the Czech director Miloš Forman, yeah. and it's Must about uh, a crazy nurse uh, obsessed with power in a mental institution and what it can do to the patients as a group and, and also how it can produce a hero. Mm -hmm. Your yeah, that's really good. Uh, yeah, I would, um, I would agree with you. 
would recommend that um, it's a wonderful movie. One flew over the cuckoo. Uh, cuckoo, cuckoo is like a, a, a weird bird, and uh, many mental institutions it was, it would be referred to as a cuckoo's nest. And so it's a bird that flew over the cuckoo's nest, looking in what was happening. Um, um, now, the other part of your question, say again. Yeah. No, no, no. In order to change anything, you have to have power. I mean, little children feel that, you know, you know what it means to go from a child to adult is you should have more and more power over your life. Um, what it means to be in a democracy is you have the power of a vote. Um, uh, what it means to have the most, for me, the most important knowledge and the most important power is the power of knowledge. I said using your mind. The reason we should be educated, education gives you new power to think differently, to think better and different than your parents ever did or anybody who went before you. Uh, knowledge makes you have creative ideas that nobody ever had. Um, we give people a Nobel Prize because they had an idea that nobody in the world before them ever had that idea in that, that same way. Um, so knowledge, power doesn't necessarily corrupt. It's, it's, I think it's when, when it's used for selfish gain, uh, I'm using my power um, to make you obey me. So again, parents, you know, as I said earlier, not all parents deserve our respect. There's some parents who insist that the children obey them, really blindly obey them. Uh, same as we said in the church. Uh, so it's, it's um, um, you need some degree of power in order to make anything work. You need electrical power to make, to make your, your radio work. Uh, you need, uh, uh, you know, power makes the world go around. Uh, only we're talking about human power and, and how much is enough how much is too much? Those are questions that we, we, those are fundamental questions about human nature. Yeah. And if I may add a political note, you probably all know the saying, I think it was Lord Acton who first coined it, uh, all power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And that's uh, uh, the sobering note, and that's why in democratic political systems, uh, you know, there is a premium on limitation of power, on self-limitation, on checks and balances, on things that prevent the power crazy individuals from getting all power. We have here two questions to he up upstairs on the right side. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hello, my name is Vladimir. My name is Vladimir. <laughs> Can you hear me like yes. this? Okay. Wonderful. Better than thank me. And, and I would like to know whether there is a specific personality or temperament which decreases probability, probability to turn an individual to a devil. Like uh, I don't know, generous or individualism or something like that. If you understand me, no. how how to how to? No, I don't. No. Tell me. I'm not getting this. Oh yes. Okay. Um. When Stanley Milgram did his research, he asked 40 American psychiatrists what percent of all Americans would go press the switch to 450 volts. They said only 1% because in every society, 1% of the population are called psychopaths. They're bro born with a brain defect that they cannot feel guilt. They cannot feel shame. They cannot. They cannot feel positive emotion seeing someone suffering. So in their mind, anybody who would, would punish someone else to that extreme 
could only be a psychopath. Now, two problems. One, not all psychopaths become criminals. If you, so that means you're born with a tendency, a push toward nature, not to feel guilt. But if you're brought up in a loving, caring environment, if you're brought up uh, uh, and without having a lot of power, you could live your whole life never doing anything wrong. But the idea is suddenly if you were brought up where you were given a lot of power or uh, you brought up in an abusing environment that you're going to use this negative power that you So psychopaths would be a negative power. Um, but in the Melgram study, they said 1%. So if 1% is personality, in Milgram it was 65%. So all the rest was the situation, was the role playing, uh, was, was the teacher, was the obedience. So again, I, what I'm saying it's almost always better to say, let me try to understand what the situation is bringing out of me, rather than what am I, bring, what am I bringing into the situation. Because in general, the social situation will predict better than personality measures. But we, uh, so there were, there were two questions up there. There's, there's Another one. Thank you. Okay. Hello, can Hello. you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Uh, Jan Slavicek from this faculty. Uh, I want to get back to the egocentrism, if I can. Yeah. I feel in kind of a way that even being a hero is being egoistic because you get dopamine, you get everything good for yourself because you feel good that you are the hero. So what's the bad thing about being egoistic? Oh, no, no. I mean, when you do a heroic deed, it should make you feel good. But our ordinary heroes are modest and humble. They say, I did what anyone could do. They're saying, what I did makes me special. You know, by helping you, um, it makes me feel good. Because you smile, you say thank you. And what I did, I will do not only for you, but I would do for her, for him. And so, ordinary heroes, we call, in our program we say, you're a hero in training. Meaning every day, in every way, in some way, you're going to do something that makes the world better person by person, act by act. And, um, and you should feel good about it. Other people say thank you. Uh, it makes your life better. You say thank you. Uh, for example, um, uh, when, I was in, when I was in Hungary two weeks ago in Budapest, um, program had a number of famous Celebrities, uh, singers, um, ballerina, uh, a comedy writer, comedian, each of them said, I'm an ambassador of the Hero Square, and for the next 30 days, I will do a chat. One of them said, I'm going to, you know, I'm, if I'm on a bus, uh, the singer, I'll stand up and say, I'd like to sing a little folk song for you, you know, to make the bus ride more, less boring. And each one said, I'm going to do something which normally I would not make, only because it's, it's awkward, it's embarrassing. We don't, we don't make social connection, not because we don't know how, it often feels awkward. So again, I say every day this month, I'm gonna give someone a compliment. Why don't we do it all the time? I have had students come to me and say, taking your course in psychology changed my whole life. I was doing poorly, I took your course, I majored in psychology, I'm the head of a, a, a mental health clinic. That was 40 years ago. I said, why did you wait 40 years to tell me? Okay. Students don't give teachers compliments. We don't give each other compliments. So why is it, it just feels awkward, it feels, you know, so essentially it becomes a habit. I mean, you, you start giving compliments every day, uh, you say, what a beautiful scarf, uh, it really makes you look even prettier, or uh, that's, that jacket is really, really dashy, I wish I had one like, so just a, you start an external, something about you, you know, I really I like that hairdo, it's really, really rocks, rocks, uh, and then you go from the external to the personal, after you talk to me, you say, hey, I really like what you said about, or I like the way you phrase that, so you go from external compliments, 
you know, about how you look, uh, to personal comments about something you said. And once you do it automatically, and I make it a challenge, I will do one a day, and people on a bus, on an elevator. Uh, now, the new challenge I said is, in San Francisco, which is the most wonderful city in the world, I grew up in New York, I lived in San Francisco 40 years, you must visit, it's it's wonderful city, it's the most European city in, in America. The only problem we have, we have a huge problem with homeless people. We have seven or more people living on the street. Sometimes whole families, many old people, many veterans, with men, many people mentally ill. And they all, many of them are begging. And after a while, people stop giving. So they sit there with their hand out, with their hat out, and people pass them by. So I said, my challenge is every day, I will make some homeless person feel special. I'm gonna make them feel as if they're a person without a home. Once you say homeless person, it's like a migrant. A migrant is what? A person who is migrating. Once you put them in a category, migrant, homeless, you treat them different. So now what it means is, I'm gonna decide each morning, I'm gonna give one dollar. Usually I give 50, I'm gonna have a dollar. And I'm gonna to decide to give it probably to an older person, older like me. But what I'm gonna do before I give it to them, I'm gonna go over and say, hi, I'm Phil Zimbardo. And you put your hand out, they gotta do it. What's your name? Michael. Michael. Good, good to see you. I'm so sorry. You're down on your luck. Too bad. I, 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 wish I, I wish I could give you more. Here's a dollar. Uh, I'll come by another day to see how you're doing. Thank you. And I leave. Sometimes they have tears in their eyes. Literally. Because pe even people give money. They, they're driving, going by. They just throw money. So essentially what you're doing is making them feel as if they are a person. They are a person who's without a home. They, they didn't grow up as a person without a home. They were mentally ill, they lost their job, uh, they're traveling from some other place, in, they're traveling from some part of America which is freezing in the winter, they come to San Francisco, it's not so cold. But that very act, it takes one minute, one minute of my time to make somebody feel special in that very little way. It's not, I could just say, hey, here's a dollar and walk on, it's saying, I am a person, you are a person, we are people, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, either down on your luck, I hope things are going to get better. And you go about your business. So this is, again, I, I say this is a challenge I will do when I get home, and I started actually when I was in Budapest, I started doing it there to people. And I would, I would encourage all of you to do the same. Yeah. Uh, now, you're all going to hate me, but... This is going to be the last question, I'm afraid. Oh. So, okay. uh, can, sorry, can you hear me? Um, this is a little bit embarrassing. I'm just above you, so there is no way you can see me. Um, but hi, um, I'm Elizabeth, and <laughs> I'm uh, definitely not going to hold back on the compliments because, uh, Mr. Zimbardo, you're one of the reasons I went to study psychology, actually. Uh -huh. And hello. <laughs> Um, so thank you for that very much and uh, I wanted to ask uh, basically I am in my third year right now and I'm doing my dissertation and I am I'm, I want to investigate um, something very relevant to your experiments uh, but in the opposite direction what I am uh, trying to look at is whether society whether as a society we can pass certain critical points in our social progress after which we cannot return back Meaning, um, for example, if, uh, um, if we vote on um, equality and uh, give women the right to vote, that perhaps a perception or this point of um, progression in the society is so critical that we can never return back after it. But, well, it's, um, it's counter-arguing your um, experiments where the individuals can come back or basically do a social regression in a prison or a situational environment, right? Um, so, regardless of your entire uh, research, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about it? Is, there, is it possible that our society reaches some critical points after which we cannot return back, we cannot regress anymore, and we, we basically pass them and that's it? Great. Uh, great question. Um, so, um, uh, that is the important, that's the power of law. So, for years, for decades, for centuries, 
women could not vote. Men were in charge. They said women are, are too uh, emotional. Women are, they don't care enough. Women don't know enough about politics. Politics is a man's business. One, it took years. It took many, many women uh, protesting, many women uh, being ridiculed to finally get one nation to have women voting, then another nation, and now almost around the world, um, maybe, maybe not in, in some Arab nation, but almost every nation has women voting. You can't even imagine it would be different. In fact, more often than not, in many nations, more women, a greater percentage of women vote than men. Um, but once, once you've made that change, you can't go back. I mean, you can't say, okay, now we're, gonna, we're not going to have women vote anymore. So the power of legislation is it changes the way people do business. I want to end with a wonderful story um, about an incredible hero, a woman, um, who changed the law in America. Until I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago, when you went on a bus or when you went on a train, there was a part of the bus that said, for colored people only, meaning black people. Black people had to sit in the back of the bus. They paid the same money as white people. White people sit here, black people sit there. So it's called segregated transportation. And for, for 100 years, everybody accepted it. You, you went on a bus, you're, you're colored, there's a place where you sit, you sit down. One day, a, a woman, Rosa Parks said, I'm not going to do it. I refuse. I paid the same money as a white person. I'm going to sit wherever I want. What happened was the bus stopped. The bus driver called the police. They put the woman in prison. They took a picture of her holding a number, 7058. This woman uh, had been a, a seamstress. She made dresses for rich white women in Atlanta, Georgia. And Atlanta, Georgia was where Martin Luther King had the center of civil rights. So they realized that this woman would be the symbol of civil rights. Here's a woman who did an uh, ordinary democratic thing to say, my rights should be, if I paid the same as you, I should get the same treatment. And they started a national movement and the law was changed. The law was changed because this woman had the, the, the power to stand up, speak out, and say, I will not do what, what is expected of me because what is expected of me is wrong. Uh, and so there's a case where it's an ordinary hero, ordinary woman. She could have lived her whole life sitting in the back of the bus. And because she refused, she said, I don't want to be treated as a second-class citizen. I want to be treated, same thing with women's voting. You know, you know I raise a family, I work hard, I do everything does, I should have equal rights to men. Uh, and so these kinds of actions, in this case by a single woman, in the other case was almost always a collective of women, ch change the way the world is run. Thank you for your question. Okay. And now? Thank you. I have a fast. I have a, I have a compliment to make oh, oh, oh. Uh, to you. <laughs> I mean, this was not only an honor and a pleasure and a very educating experience, <laughs> but it was a very warming experience. And, and I don't know about you, I think you had a wonderful time. I had a wonderful time. Thank you very much. Professor Zimbardo will now stay on for a little longer, sign books, pictures, take photographs, because he's a real person, right? Okay. Thank you.